well, we're, uh, we have the ple pleasure of having Misha Peters come and talk about the OpenBSD hypervisor in the wild. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be time for question and answer at the end. So please hold your questions until then, and we'll leave a few minutes at the end. And with that, thank, thank you. you. It's a little bit weird that you're introducing me, though, being the guy that's written it all, and some other people here. So good morning. Welcome. Um, I like the intimate room that I'm in. It's really nice. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the BSD hypervisor, OpenBSD hypervisor, uh, that I'm using for OpenBSD Amsterdam. Um, uh, first, I have to apologize. I'm presenting this from a Mac. I was not planning to, but I'm flying to the US, and I don't like to take my personal notebook into the US, so that's why I'm using on my work notebook. This is my personal notebook, so that you know. Um, and a little bit about me. Um, I started way back when um, at Access for All, uh, ISP in the Netherlands, um, when it was like this in the, in the picture. Um, and s since then, I started working for, for vendors, so I worked for, for companies like, like Blue Code and Foundry that people might know. Um, and I also started around that time with FreeBSD. Um, later on, added OpenBSD to, uh, to the mix. Um, and when uh, Mike started working on the, on the hypervisor, I thought, oh, this is great, so let's, uh, let's do that. So I'm going to talk about how it all started, uh, the setup, the things that I've seen, uh, what users are experiencing, so hopefully you get a, a good picture of, uh, of uh, what's going on. And I've been doing some hosting and co-location since 99 as a little bit out of hand hobby uh, that, that snowballed. Um, but what about you? Um, so who's using OpenBSD? Ooh, cool. Um, who's using VMM VMD? Who's on OpenBSD Amsterdam? Yeah, all right, cool. That's, that's pretty good, awesome. So, how did it all begin? Um, I was always using uh, forms of segmentation or virtualization, um, always looking for something that was running on the BSDs properly or useful. Um, so I'm st I started with jails, still using jails. I really like jails. Um, then came Beehive for me at least. Um, I I do like Beehive, I think it's a little bit too complex, so I was very happy when Mike started working on, on VMM, VMD, and I just moved everything uh, since I'm not running any Linux uh, uh, VMs anyway, so that helped. Um, the other thing is, what I noticed on my co-location side was that a lot of people were moving to the cloud, so a lot of people would just leave. Uh, remove their hardware, so I had some rack space left, I had some hardware left, I had spare IP space, IPv4 space, I must say. Um, and I also always wanted to have a domain with something BSD, and I think Hessler has taken a lot of the cool ones, and probably some others here in the room, and I went, okay. Um, and then .amsterdam came along, and went, oh, okay, maybe I can do something with openbsd.amsterdam. Uh, so that, and also wanted to, to find a way to actually contribute back to the community. Um, I'm not a C coder or, or coder that much. I'm a, I'm a spaghetti scripter, uh, so I can get things done, but not in a very structured fashion. Um, and I also wanted to see and, and, and help out a little bit how far we can actually uh, take this thing and, and where things were, were breaking. Um, so that's how it all uh, started. So on the, on the right-hand side, you see a picture of, of some of the machines that we're using. Um, and domain for shits and giggles, so I registered it last year in uh, June, um, and that's when the whole, or um, April actually, um, uh, March, um, and that's when the whole thing uh, started kicking off. So where is it? It is in Amsterdam. Um, it's actually in a data center in Amsterdam. I don't live there, but all the hardware is there. Uh, it's in the Access Role data center, which is KPN these days. Um, and it's all running primarily on Dell R610s connected to a Foundry switch, connected to a Foundry router. Uh, I work for Foundry, so I have a love relationship with Foundry. I, I get the CLI. Um, I've tried Juniper. It doesn't really stick. Um, and I buy these things on, on eBay, so it doesn't really cost a lot of money. So it, it started on Twitter. I started talking a little bit with people on Twitter, saying, hey, uh, what, what can we do? Would you, would you host a, a VM? Um, and the first machine I brought online 
uh, which was some of the spare hardware that I had. It's a box with, with 8 gig of, of RAM. There's still some VMs running there. Um, <clears throat> and this was actually one of the first, let's say, official tweets that I sent out. Um, and I also wanted to know what people were willing to pay. So I sent out a poll on Twitter and said, hey, what are you willing to pay for a VM that looks like this? Um, so a lot of people were uh, around the 5 euro, this is in euros, 5 euro mark. And I went, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, so started building uh, VMs uh, based on that. So they're five euros a month, and of the donation or of the, the yearly fee, I donate five euros to the OpenBSD Foundation. Ten euros, sorry. Um, then I was able to get rid of some VMs that I was running on this machine that I brought online. Um, and this was actually the, 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 the machine that, that kick-started the whole thing. Um, this was able to take 50 VMs uh, uh, on it. Um, and out of that came the first donation to the OpenBSD Foundation, which I thought was really cool. Um, and we, I was able to donate 400 euros based on the first, I think, first month uh, of, uh, of running this. So a little bit of the statistics so you know where we, uh, where we are. Um, the last donation was 370 euros, um, 850 last year, 1700 year to date, um, total of 3500 uh, euros. I'm running eight hosts. I still count the first one even though it it's doesn't really... I want to move them. Uh, there's only 10 VMs currently running on there. Um, but it, I still count it, um, and there's roughly 280 uh, VMs. So we had some renewals already, and what I'm seeing is that the amount of renewals, or, or the amount of people that don't renew, actually get replenished by people that get a VM. So it, it, it's pretty stable. Um, and I really want to break through the 300. No idea why, but it's this mental uh, thing that I want to uh, uh, get. So what do you get? You get an opinionated VM. If you've been on, on the website, that's what you, what you see. You get an opinionated VM. So initially, that meant um, I decide the install sets, uh, um, I, I pre-configure a couple of things, um, and it's running OpenBSD VM on OpenBSD. I'm not going to give you a, a Linux VM or, or anything else. It's an OpenBSD VM. Now, with 6.6 .6 coming and sysupgrade, I'm going to let go of the install sets. I'm just going to install everything so you don't have any issues there. I heard Theo yelling at a couple of people on our, not heard, saw Theo yelling on the mailing list. If you want to, I also asked that question um, to exclude certain sets from the sys upgrades uh, uh, process. And he went, don't do that. OK. Um, but what do you actually uh, uh, get? So you get 512 meg of RAM, uh, 50 gig disks, IPv4 assigned via DHCP, even though it's a static IP address that's assigned to your uh, VM, um, and you get an IPv6 subnet uh, slash 56 that is statically assigned during the whole install process. Um, and what I've noticed during doing this, I'm, I'm very used to just assign my router as the gateway. Um, so I started adding v6 addresses uh, uh, on the gateway, and then all of a sudden, well, I cannot hold more any v6. Uh, routes. And I went, hmm, that's annoying. Um, so what I started doing was actually the host is the gateway for all the VMs in regards to V6. So V4 still goes to uh, the router itself because all the VMs are in a slash 24. I'm thinking about changing it because I'm hitting some snags with Bridge and I had some interesting discussions already uh, uh, with some people, but that's something that I'm uh, considering or, or at least investigating if there's a way uh, around it. But personally, I do like layer two. Is Blake in the room? Sorry. I do like layer two. It's easy. Anyway, so what does the, the, the setup look like? Um, I try to use as much in base as possible. So it does influence uh, some of the design decisions that we've done, uh, no, that I've done. Um, so this is pretty much the list. So I'm using Perl. Uh, um, how I uh, deploy, so I've written a deploy script in Perl um, using VMM, VMD, of course, DHCP, the auto install uh, site uh, scripts during the auto install process, um, HTTP to serve the sets, um, and then sensors D, uh, uh, and I mentioned this specifically because I 
figured something annoying out, which I'll mention later, uh, uh, to keep track of the, of the disks primarily, and of course, VI. Um, so what I'm doing with Perl is I started with a very nasty script. Um, because when I, when I announced, hey, you can now get a VM, I had this, this half-baked form, and I had some information in there, and I threw it in a file, and I went, okay, so how do I actually get all these files instead of doing this manually? So I built a really nasty Perl script, and yes, you can debate if you can write nice Perl. That's fine. Um, but what the, uh, uh, the Perl script does, it will uh, maintain and create vm.conf. It will maintain and create dgpd.conf. Um, it creates uh, an install.com for every single VM. So every VM is a fresh install. It's not a clone of an image. Um, I've also noticed some other quirks. So it also maintains doas.com now. Um, and it's responsible for the user creation as well as the, the VM creation. Um, so as soon as I, I, I run that, all these things happen and have some, some uh, flows how that, uh, how that works. Um, so the VM of conf, if you're familiar with it, um, I assign a switch, a bridge. Um, I always assign an owner to a VM, so you can connect to the console yourself. You can stop it. You can start it. Um, you get a disk. And I also assign a static MAC address that Perl script creates. Um, because with that, I then assign the v4 address, let's say, statically. Um, the dhpd.conf. Um, similar, so I have that same uh, static MAC address. I assign an IP address, and I also say that um, it's now auto install. So as soon as I start, I boot up that, uh, that VM. I must say that when it's a new VM, I also have a, a boot line here. So it boots from bsd.rd. So then the auto install knows that it has to uh, uh, kick in. Um, then I have an auto-install script for every single VM that I built, again, based on uh, the MAC address. So if you provide me with your, your host name, I put that in. Uh, the v6 addresses are assigned, your username uh, that you provided, your SSH key, uh, I cut and paste in there. Um, and then these sets here, that will probably go away, and this will be plus, set, plus site uh, uh, star moving forward. Um, and because of that, I have to do continue anyway. Yes, verification. Yes. Um, so that's then what the uh, VM is being uh, being built on. Um, then I'm using site.tgc uh, uh, to actually uh, do some pre-configuration that makes it easier for you, makes it easier for me. So it sets the install URL to cdn.openbsd.org, and it also changes the uh, the clock. Is it a format or a, a method or how do you call that clock? The the, the hardware. The, the source of the time counter for the kernel. Okay, the source of the time counter of the kernel. Okay, um, and the reason why we're doing this is because uh, the default is I A three something something. Yeah, um, I can talk about it at the end. At the end. Okay, cool. So I'm setting this because there are some synchronization. Let's say challenges uh, uh, within the VM in regards to, uh, to the clock. Um, and then I set NTPD, um, and also I turn off uh, the sound daemon, because, well, you don't really need it. Um, so that's in the, in the site uh, uh, file. Then I'm using HTTPD on, on one of my hosts to actually serve all the, all the sets, and every single um, host has an HTTPD running for um, the install files. So every single host has its own little, uh, little world in regards to that. Um, the reason why I, I wanted to mention sensors is that a lot of the examples that you see, um, you actually uh, get, like, if disk fails, then run this command in the sensor d.conf. Um, I figured out, uh, um, luckily only one disk failed, that that doesn't work. You actually need to uh, call a script out of sensor D in order to actually get any action out of it. So I, either an email that's being sent or whatever the action might be. Um, so I luckily called that uh, uh, quite quickly. Uh, so I was able to replace the disk without any problems. But then I started digging into the whole sensor D and the config and, and how that works. Um, so I 
so this is now the way that I'm using it. So the, the command is on top, sensity.conf. Um, it, it, it calls a, a script with a bunch of parameters that are also there, and then it sends me an email saying, hey, disk is OK at boot. And when the disk fails, it sends me, disk is not OK. So I know to, uh, to replace it. Um, so how do I actually deploy? It's not fully automated. There are still some manual steps that are there. Um, and currently, that, that works for me. So as I mentioned, every host has its own little world that it exists in. So I have a configuration for a specific host. So I define uh, the prefix of a MAC address, a MAC address that they use, uh, um, IP address, IPv6 address, uh, where all the, the, the files should go, um, and what the default setup is for a VM. So how much memory, uh, disk, if it's one disk, two disks, uh, what the image format is, what bridge they, they need to use or, or uplink need to use, and so on. So based on this, I just have a single script that I copy to all the hosts, and then based on the configuration, it knows what to do and what the, what the defaults are. I thought it was a good idea at the time. Um, so the flow in itself is I have a uh, contact form on our website. Um, so you put all your information in there. That sends me an email um, in, in rightly uh, formatted. I put that in a text file. Um, so I look, hey, which VM ID is, is still available? Um, if it's full, I take a different host. Um, I paste that in. And then I run the, the deploy script. Um, I restart DHCPD, I reload VMD to actually take the new configuration, um, and then I start the VM and I hit A, um, because Pixie is not working. <laughs> and I think Philip does a whole talk about how he packerized this, uh, um, but as I said, I like to use a lot of things in base, and, and for me, just hitting A and waiting for it to finish is fine. I can probably wrap it around expect or, or do something else, but it's, for me, this works. Um, and I don't have to deploy like 10s or 20 VMs a day. It's, it's one or two max, roughly, um, in average. So this is what the, what the contact form uh, looks like. Uh, you can select if you want to have 512 uh, mega memory, one gig. Um, how much disk space you need, um, what, the, what the image format is. I default now to Kikyo, Kikau 2, um, so that I save a little bit on, on disk space, especially if I move it. Um, and then based on this, I put everything in the, in the, in the text file, which roughly looks like this. So it's just uh, a quoted text that I just push into Perl, um, or that Perl uh, parses. Uh, so that it knows uh, what to do. Um, when I then run uh, deploy, uh, deploy.pl, um, it creates the, the install file, it creates the user, uh, creates the, uh, at least that's what I'm seeing. It also does the DOAS and the DHCP, um, but these are the things that I'm most interested about. If the, uh, uh, the user, it could be that the user existed already, uh, so then I have to fix that, um, or something failed with the, with the image creation. <laughs> And if you select that you want more disk space, it will create two disks uh, here, or two images here. And once the whole install is done, I run it again, and that script also removes the install.com file. Um, then I do uh, VM control reload, I restart DHCPD, and then I start the VM, um, and as I mentioned, I hit A. Um, so what did we find during this whole uh, uh, process? Um, one of the things is that very early on, um, the owner of a VM always had to be in group wheel. Now, personally, I don't find that a problem. There's, there's this unauthorized section in the upgrade manual that says, if you don't have access to the console, you can do this. We don't recommend it. And then, yeah, people can just do that. That's not a problem. Um, and then people went, ah, no, you cannot do this. You have to have console and yada yada. So I went, okay, um, right. What can we do? Um, is there a way that I can define another user group uh, or another group where I can assign users so that they, these users can look at uh, their VM instead of adding everybody to wheel, which I thought was not a good idea. Um, so Reich thought that was a good idea, and he really quickly managed to, to put that in. So from then on, um, I used uh, VMD underscore VMD users to 
put all the, the users in so they can actually uh, control their own uh, VM instead of asking me. Um, the other thing that is quite interesting if you're starting doing anything with, with virtual machines is you need a tap interface. Um, by default, um, there's four. Um, so if you run more than four, you need to create your tap interface. And this, this was initially a head scratch. I thought, why is it not working? Because it wasn't really clear that it was failing on, on an interface. So on every new host that I deploy, I run this, uh, this for loop uh, that just creates up to 50 uh, uh, tap interfaces. So I always have enough. Because on average, um, 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 a host runs around 40 VMs. Because that's another thing that we... Uh, that I discovered quite quickly is that if you, especially on older hardware, if you add more uh, uh, VMs, weird things happen. Uh, disk, interface, bridge, uh, memory. Um, so on the Dell R610s, we are using only up to 40 uh, VMs, and that works reasonably well. Um, another thing is, uh, people were supplying me with a uh, SSH key, but I didn't want to send them a password over email, saying, hey, this is your root password. Um, I, one way that I wanted to do this, and, and from an automation perspective, is I wanted to do this during the, the auto-install. Um, so what I've been doing is actually I generate a, a random password with Jot. Uh, thank you, Roman, for that. Um, and then I add it to the authorized keys at the end as a comment. Uh, so that as soon as you log in with your SSH key, you just look into that file and you have your root password and the password of your user. Um, I thought it was clever. I was very happy to see that Reich also thought it was clever. Uh, so he, uh, he borrowed that idea. Um, uh, but there's probably... Oh, and this also started um, before uh, Duas was there. Um, because now you could also potentially say, well, this user gets uh, set up into do as with a, a no pass, and then you can do whatever you want. So that would be another way that I would probably maybe do that today. Um, another thing was in the beginning uh, was stopping VMs uh, was a little bit of an issue. Um, if you stop everything in one go, it's not a good idea. Um, so I was trying to actually emulate like like normal shutdown. Uh, so what I've done is I um, parsed VM control through a for loop with awk, looking at all the machines that were started, um, and then would stop them and wait for 30 seconds to stop the other one. Uh, now you can just do that with uh, VM control stop a uh, W. So it would um, stop all and it will wait for that VM to be stopped. In most cases that works really, really well. Um, another interesting challenge is actually starting VMs. So I'm doing something similar, but instead of using stop, I'm using start. Um, when it was a clean shutdown of the host, I used 30 seconds. If it crashed, I used 90 or more. Um, because what is really bad is if you have two, worse, more VMs that are going through an FS check. Uh, that will slow things down dramatically, and it's not pleasant for the VMs that have started. Um, so I do, hopefully I can see if it was a clean shutdown or not, um, but then uh, when it was not not, I used 90 seconds. Um, another interesting one, um, especially in the beginning, I saw that a lot of VMs were, uh, were disappearing. Um, so they would have connectivity, and then all of a sudden, connectivity would, would, would go away, or um, you could not reach it anymore. Um, so I, Claudio pointed me to um, the ARPQ sys control um, that by default sits on 50. Now, in normal environments, and just for your machine in a layer 2 network, it's not usually a big of a problem. Um, but since I'm pushing a slash 24 onto a host with 40 VMs, that becomes a little bit of a problem. Um, so we saw a lot of uh, drops, and um, I started playing a little bit with the numbers. I have started with 512. Um, I still had drops. I uh, did uh, 756, still had drops. So I increased it to uh, 2024. And, and it seemed that that is solving a lot of the, the, the connectivity issues that we've been noticing. Um, 
So what are users experiencing? Because this is a little bit on, on, the, on the side that I've been uh, stumbling into things. Uh, but on the user side, there's, of course, also quirks and, and, and things that we had to get used to. Um, so in some cases, and this all depends on how, uh, or how the VM boots and at what stage it boots and what was happening on the host, but sometimes the um, the VM gets a little bit skewed from um, uh, the clock hertz of the host. And when that is a little bit off, you get a lot of clock drift within the VM. Um, so one way, and, and the way that, that, that Paul is, is fixing this is he looks at the, the clock drift um, of the VM, and if it's too far, he just reboots the machine to see if it's a little bit closer. Now, with 40 VMs or 50, um, I thought that was not such a good idea. Um, so I fixed it uh, like very rudimentary, where um, I suggest people just to put our date in, in cron. Um, in general, this works well. Some VMs um, have to, to, to screw this a little bit lower. Um, and I have one user running Alpine, and he's just, yeah, he's on his own. You have to, he has to sync his clock every, every second. Um, Another thing is that I got a lot of questions about was there's a high interrupt on uh, the CPU within the VM. Um, and I have a page on the website with all the known, let's say, challenges, issues. Uh, um, and this is, uh, so I, I'm using some of the, the information that Mike gave me. Um, it's like an accounting uh, error. But I did get some questions going, hey, what's going on? I don't have anything started. Uh, um, is something wrong with the host? So I started compiling that list of, uh, of, of things. Um, and there's also links in my presentation that point to explanations of Mike or Reich um, about some of the things that we've seen. Um, so when I s managed to figure out this ARPQ thing, um, a lot of the connectivity problems went away, and it was great. Um, and then all of a sudden, on a Friday, no idea why, I started getting connectivity issues again. And it wasn't just one host, it was all of them, including my own, without not too many VMs running. And I've been scratching my head since. Um, but one great way of fixing this is just either ping from cron. So the tricky, is, the tricky part is that as soon as it's, it's gone, uh, you have to start some connectivity from within the VM to the outside world. Um, so the way that you can do that is either do it in cron every five minutes, um, but at the moment it's, it's pretty bad that that doesn't even help anymore. So what I've started doing was just starting Tmux with ping minus i to my gateway, and for now that seems to solve the problem a little bit. Um, but that's a, that, yeah, that's a head scratcher. Um, another thing that we've seen is um, a VM can become unresponsive. So nothing to do with connectivity, um, but it would either consume a lot of CPU resources, um, and a VM control stop would not work. Um, it would just be hanging in, in, in stopping mode. Um, so every once in a while, if I, I see it, I fix it for, for, for the user, but sometimes I get a, uh, an email from someone saying, hey, I cannot reach my VM, can you do something? And I'm like, okay. So I need to figure out a way that that user, they can run VM control stop, but they should also be able to just kill that. Um, and I thought about doing something with kill, and then you go, okay, yeah, root, and then do as. So the way that I worked around it was with pkill. Um, because what you can do, you can actually define, the, let's say, the string or the process uh, uh, specifically that you can uh, kill. So that's why I said the Perl script now also uh, manages doas.conf. Um, so this part is in, in the doas.configuration, and this is then what you can use uh, and run as a user. So you can just kill your own uh, VM if need be, um, because I have all that information. Um, and I think some people have already used it. Um, so my wish list, what I would like to see in the, in the future, is a working PXE that will save me from hitting A. Um, less clock drift, no clock drift. There's, there's things that are, that are possible there. Um, um, another thing that I would like to do is move away from, from bridge. 
So either looking at switch or layer three, um, we had some interesting discussions already in the last couple of days around that. Um, one of the things that I would like to do is automate more. So the whole flow of getting that email, putting it into a file, starting the VM, um, I would like to, to do that more automated so I can uh, uh, get that VM deployed uh, a lot quicker. And I really want to hit that 300 um, just for my own uh, fun, I would say. So I do want to thank a couple of people because uh, I could not do this without, especially Mike, and Reich, and Carlos, and Stefan, and Claudio, and Jasper, and Ori. Um, so these are the main committers and contributors to uh, VMM VMD. Um, and we figured out yesterday that there's around 47 people that actually made commits to VMM VMD. Uh, so that's, uh, that's quite impressive. And I also want to thank Roman uh, for uh, the artwork, uh, uh, for pushing, for helping, for uh, um, getting the word out. Uh, uh, wearing the t-shirt together with Reich and, some, and, and, and Fred. Um, and of course, you, the users that are actually getting a VM on the, on the platform and see how far we can uh, drive this thing. Um, so that is my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. And this is without background image, so it's a little bit easier to read. Any questions? This one's dead. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> if there's any questions, the uh, microphone's right up here, and I also have a Or portable. suggestions, or feedback, or say, hey, this is stupid. Don't do this. Not too many, though. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, what is, do you, um, have you considered uh, giving a prefix to a VM or are, I, I have seen in the config that you are basically giving a VM one IPv6 address? Um, no, a prefix. A prefix yeah. and is it slash 64 or was 56. it? 56. Um, yeah, uh, but that's to the host, not to the, not to the VM. No, that's to the VM. Oh, okay, okay. That's yeah. generous. And I, I do, of course, generate already a slash 28, but the, the host has a 56. Okay. Sorry, VM, VM, yes. Host has 40, 56 prefixes. I, uh, did, do you have any private network options, or do you think about adding the possibility of building a VPC for a customer. Thanks. To have two VMs in the private network? Yes, um, or more, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I thought about that. Uh, um, I had, of all the people that are running a VM, I had that question once. Um, also had that question if there could be two VMs, active standby, active active. So I've been thinking about either adding a second interface or adding a separate network segment so I can run CARP or thinking about it. But n the nice thing is not a lot of people ask for it. So I don't have to think about it too hard. <laughs> yes. Uh, so any plans to, oops, any plans to add any other locations like new data centers or anything? I don't have the domain, so. <laughs> no, it's the, 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 the nice thing is, uh, um, I think someone said, hey, this is a great idea, I want to do this in London, and then he worked on the numbers and he went, ooh, I cannot really do this. Um, the benefit that I have is, uh, since I, I do hosting and co-location, I have rec space, I have IP space, uh, um, I have traffic, um, so a lot of the costs are already carried by my own company. Um, otherwise, this would not really be a, a viable uh, business model. Um, with only five euro VMs. Um, you, you then have to also do like the, 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 the 20 euro a month VMs. Then, then it could potentially uh, work. But I think what I, what I personally like about the product, it's, it's, it's community from the community for the community. So I, I don't make any money of this. I don't want to make any money of this. It's, it's self-sustaining to an extent, I guess. Um, and because of all the money that, that came out of a, uh, out of a host, I, I bought the new server, and then that machine bought for uh, or paid for the, the, the other machine. So it's, it's, it's self-sustaining. 
Uh, and I think in adding a new location, regardless where that would be, probably would not work uh, economically. Okay, thank you again for great service. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Hello. So this, this is uh, a bit like a, a test bed for the technology, right? Um, that's how it started. Uh, um, there, there's, there's a disclaimer there that, that it's, it's an active development, things break, um, but people don't read. Uh, <laughs> so there's also DNS running in there, and there's email environments running in there. Um, so there's, I think there's even some people that are running production type services on this. And I go, okay, <laughs> it's great. So on a but, yeah. one to five scale, for let's say if someone is more interested in, uh, okay, I, AWS doesn't support officially OpenBSD and here is someone who gives a really nice environment for this, then from one to five, how would you rate the production readiness of this enterprise? I would say try it, <laughs> and then if you like it, pay it. Um, um, I, I run all my production environment in, in VMM and VMD as well. Um, I, I suffer from some of the quirks that, that, that the whole platform is suffering from. Um, but for me, it works, right? Because uh, the, the, my own company is also a hobby project. I don't have to make a lot of money out of it. Um, but if, if, especially if you do something with payments, I would not do that. If it's a website or a forum or, or internal communication platform, Probably, yeah. There's ways around to, to work around the connectivity issues that that's not really a problem. Uh, do you collect some data about the, uh, let's say, average uptimes of these VMs? Because you said they can become unresponsive or stuff like that. So I don't know if VMCTL shows data like this, but maybe you could do some nice graphs or whatever. Um, so if I... Uh, um, get any, any telemetry out of the VMs, uptime, and, and things like that? Um, no, I don't. Um, I do get some telemetry out of the host um, uh, in regards to CPU load and, and, and traffic, um, but nothing on, on, on individual VMs uptime. That, that's, that's an interesting one, yeah. yeah. So, Martin, Martin, let's get cracking on HNX. Thank you. Sure. Five minutes. I have some questions for you about this thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, not really. I'm, I'm just want to make a, a statement here because, like, uh, whenever this VMD VMM thing started, when when Mike showed me the first lines of D message in back in a bar in Berlin at some point, I think uh, I was thinking it would be so nice. And excuse me for the word to have some cloud kind of thing uh, that runs on an OpenBSD hypervisor right. because all this cloud stuff is unavoidable these days and we ported OpenBSD to most of these platforms and then you still run on a shitty Linux or well, maybe on a FreeBSD, but <laughs> it, if I cannot trust the hypervisor when yeah, one is it. Right. And then, but not just doing this for testing, really run a cloud-like platform or right. opinionated VMs or something like this. And then later you just showed up and did it. Yeah? And it helps us so much because of these things. I mean, these features, we get many feature requests for things that are weird or pointless, but from you, it, it really helps moving forward. Good. Um, so, we need more projects like this, really. We, we need pe people who, whatever, do s something similar, and this happens deploying VGP routers from OpenBSD or whatever, right. just doing something like this. And, uh, and then, actually, <laughs> you're the one who proved that you can run this stuff in production to us developers. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's pretty it's amazing. So my, my kudos for this here publicly. Thank absolutely. you. So economically, it's a great way to do this, do this in other cities. Thanks, Reich. Hi. 
Uh, do you use or would you use uh, VMMs, OpenBSD VMMs on other people's computers as a user? Would I use VMM on other people's computer? What do you mean? Like, uh, you know, you host VMMs yeah. and you have users that use them. Would you or do you personally use VMMs which are hosted on computers controlled by other people? I actually, I don't. I don't host, uh, I don't know any other environment where you can do that, where you can actually have a VM on OpenBSD, VMM, somewhere else. But would you, if I provided you with a VMM, would you actively use it? Depends how much it is. <laughs> if it was free? Uh, sure. Okay, thanks. Sure. I'm Just Dutch, of course, free. <laughs> okay. And another question about virtualization. OpenBSD uh, was uh, up until a few years ago completely against any kind of virtualization. <laughs> and even then, you know, you need some kind of containerization if you run it on, your, on uh, hosts you own. But now we see the, the OpenBSD moving in another direction in you know, hosting, providing VMMs. Can you explain a bit the uh, change in the, in the politics that or strategy? That would not really be a question I can answer. But Mike, maybe. <laughs> Just try turning it off and on again. Um, the whole topic of how VMM and VMD started is probably a topic that they talked that we should have later because we're almost out of time and it's going to take much longer than two minutes. Um, but I'm happy to have that conversation with you or indeed anybody that's in attendance. If you'd like to know more about the platform, how we built it, what our goals were, the history around it, I'm absolutely happy to do that. Just find me later, uh, later today, tomorrow, I'll be around. Um, but it, it probably will take more time than what we have now. So and happy to some, talk about it later. And there's some good talks already online that you did. Yep. So. Yeah. One more. It's not, not really related to the OpenBSD uh, uh, VMM part of things, but do you okay. do anything with uh, <laughs> do you do anything with with reverse DNS uh, either v4 or v6? Sorry, say again. Do you do anything re with reverse DNS? Absolutely. Or yes, I, I I need to because there's people running their mail environment on OpenBSD Amsterdam. So yes, yeah, uh, not by default. Um, uh, that can be something that I'm considering, um, but currently it's just fire off an email or put it in the, the note field in the contact form, say, hey, just put reverse DNS to this domain and I'll, I'll fix it. It's, uh, it. it's not a big deal. But not a lot of people actually request it. Yeah, yes, exactly. That was my reaction as well. well why not? But yeah. Well, actually, I have someone that doesn't have a domain. So they, they said, yeah, no, I want to do something with mail, but I don't have a domain. Uh, OK, well, I can give you a host on, on OpenBSD Amsterdam. Oh, great. Uh, let's encrypt. Done. So yeah, so that, that's also an option. You can, all the, uh, you can also have a host name .openbsd.amsterdam. Um, I would be happy to reverse that into uh, your VM as well, not a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you.